Welcome, everyone. It is week three of our three-part Bible study. Glad you could join us. This is a very important week. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about tonight. We're going to definitely take the whole hour. And I hope everyone can join us. Let's go ahead and start sharing the video, guys, so that we can get the word out. Of course, that takes a little while for everyone to figure out that we're on, that we're live. Facebook does not exactly make it easy for anyone to find our stuff, so uh, the more you share, the better. <clears throat> How's everybody's week going so far? Let me know you're here. Sean's here early. Good to see you, brother. Thanks for being here. Anyway, as I was saying, we've got a really important week ahead, or uh, night ahead of us. We've got the culmination of our study on works in the gospel. This is week three, the final installment, and I'm glad you tuned in because this is going to be a very, very important week. We're going to take the whole hour, no doubt, um, and we're going to really hit the ground running here in just a minute. So I hope you got your Bibles, hope you got your coffee, hope you're ready to roll. Um, if you have any questions, get them in right away. Let me go ahead and share this myself. Oh, and also post the first comment here for anyone who's still wants to get a copy of the book. There's a link right there, and you can uh, also follow the follow the directions. If anybody needs any instructions on how to share it and invite your friends and share it to groups and all that, that's in the first comment of the video. Um, <clears throat> Ryan Swope is here. All right, glad to see you, brother. If you're just joining us, guys, we're just about to get started. Say hi. Let us know you're here. Let us know how you're doing. Let me go ahead and share this to our repentance group. If you're not a member, shameless plug, join up. It's called um, uh, Christians for Repentance in the Gospel. It is a Facebook group. Lots of good insights and quotes and uh, different things in there that you can get help with if you have any questions. We are going to be talking, Douglas Town is on. Hey, brother, glad to see you. We are going to be talking tonight about the part that no one else likes to talk about when they discuss works in the gospel. People generally, um, at least in you know conservative circles, evangelical circles, will generally say that works have no place in the gospel. You cannot be saved by works. And they're right, as we have seen over the past two, uh, two weeks. However... That is not the end of the story, and you can't stop there. Because after salvation, works and the gospel are actually hand in hand. You cannot separate them, and when you do, you wind up getting this antinomian sect, or cult, or heresy, or whatever you want to call it, that teaches that you can be a Christian and not actually be holy. How can you be a saint? without being a saint. How can you be a saint if you're still a sinner? So, some of the very controversial things we're going to be getting into tonight include um, whether a saint can backslide or not. Is it possible for a saint to backslide? Well, we're going to see what the Bible has to say about that. Douglas Towns is probably going to head to Dreamland while listening. Oh, I hope not, brother. I hope I'm bore you to sleep. This is going to be a very interesting week. We're going to be looking at a lot of passages. I hope you can join and and uh, look up these verses with us. We're also going to be looking at sanctification and the preservation, as I like to put it. Uh, some put it the perseverance of the saints. Um, whether whether or not God keeps His children secure and persevering in the uh, in the faith, or whether they can fall away. Uh, something else we're going to be dealing with: Are sinners marked by sin, sin, and saints marked by sanctification? Or can you mix it up a bit? And we're going to discuss sinless perfectionism. That's a hot topic. Can a Christian stop sinning? All right, let me share this to my own page now. If you're not a friend of mine on Facebook, send me a friend request. My personal timeline is actually my ministry page. Um, Repentance from Sin is just the page for the book, whereas I'm, uh, I'm more active in general ministry work on my page. You can just look me up, Joshua Jocelyn. Uh, my ministry name is Truth and Mercy Baptist Ministries. Um, speaking of which, guys, this is our last week. If you have any other uh, ideas, I, I wouldn't mind doing another study, maybe a little mini study like this. Um, let me know in the comments below if you have any ideas for future studies that we could do. 
Um, we could do them. We don't have to do them on this repentance page. They don't necessarily have to be about repentance or the gospel like we've been doing. Um, they could be about anything related to the Bible. Um, sh share in the comments if you have any ideas about that. We could always just do it on my main timeline, on my uh, tr Truth and Mercy Baptist Ministries Facebook timeline. Anyway, okay, I've got it shared. Looks like we've got a few people on. Oh, Ryan Swope is already commenting. Let me refresh the page here so I can see. Well, I might be able to just read it right here. All right, so he says, Before any man can walk in the good works which God hath before ordained, before he can be a workman for God, he must be the workmanship of God. He must first be worked upon by God before his work will be acceptable to God. Yes, but when does this work take place? He then quotes uh, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Amen, for by grace. Yeah. So the question is, do you have to wait until the end of your life to be sanctified, or can you be sanctified at the new birth? And that's what we're going to discuss tonight. So, hope everyone has their coffee ready, their Bibles handy. We're about to get real busy. All right, if you would, turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a lot of you probably know exactly where we're about to turn. This will be the theme verse for tonight. Verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Not will be when God works on him or down the road, but is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Not will be, but are passed away. Yes, you can grow in maturity, and yes, God does work on you. You're right, brother. God does work on us and, and improves on us as we go, but that doesn't change the fact that if any man be in Christ, at the new birth, he is a new creature. That is a done deal. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Are become new. Not will be. So, what does that entail? Well, by the way, if you're just joining us, guys, be sure to share. That's definitely the best way to get the word out. Facebook does not make it easy for people to find these videos. So, be sure to share these to your favorite groups, on your own timeline, whatever. All right, let's look over at Titus chapter 2. Let's look at Titus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. We're going to be moving very quickly. Got a lot of ground to cover tonight. Uh, but if you have any questions or comments, throw them in there. I will try to get to them. If I can't get to them during the broadcast, I'll get to them afterwards. I do enjoy hearing your feedback. I hate doing a monologue. I'd rather have an interaction here. But we are going to be moving kind of quickly. All right, Titus chapter 2, looking at a lot of verses tonight because that's what matters. What does God say? Not what do I say. What does God say? Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation, all right, there's the gospel. We've already seen that the that gospel the gospel does not include works, but it does bring works. That is the relationship of the law to the gospel. Here we go. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us what? That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly righteously and godly in this present world. That's what the gospel teaches us, to live righteously, to deny uh, ungodliness. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, why? That he might redeem us from all iniquities uh, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So what was the point of the gospel? Why did Jesus die? To save us from hell? Well, as a byproduct, but the Bible says that the main reason God saved us was to purify us from iniquity and to make a people called out for his name, zealous of good works. So when, when you preach against works in the gospel, don't neglect to then also add that the gospel brings works. You cannot separate works out of the gospel. Works are do not bring salvation, but they must follow salvation or there never was any to begin with. And we're going to get into that, especially in James, but it's really throughout the Bible. In fact, this is an incomplete study. I've been studying this out for months and I have, I'm constantly finding new references to add to my list. And I'm only going to give you maybe half of what I've found so far. And I know there's plenty more out there. All right. So what's the next reference we'll look at here? Yeah, let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. Can a Christian backslide? Hmm. What do we got here? Got some new comments here. Um, 
Ryan Swope says, no need to comment, just helping. I appreciate it, brother. If I can, I like to comment on anything that's in here. That way we keep a group discussion. Um, but I appreciate it. I, I won't feel obligated necessarily, but uh, I think it makes the discussion more interesting if I try to comment uh, on anything you guys ask or, or throw into the discussion. I appreciate your, your contributions. All right, Hebrews chapter 10. And look over at, uh, starting in verse 38. <clears throat> Now, the just shall live by faith. I'd like to point out real quickly, he doesn't say the just must live by faith. You really should live by faith. No, he said shall live by faith. If you're justified before God, if you're a born-again Christian, you will live by faith. But if any man draw back, thy soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now, some people here teach conditional security, that you can lose your salvation. Because he says, if, if you draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. They should read the next verse, however, because it plainly says that saved people don't draw back. They don't backslide. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. From this verse, we can see that if we were to backslide, we would go to hell. Why? Would we lose our salvation? Well, no. But sinners go to hell and saints go to heaven. That's the way God hath ordained it. And that's the way it is, and we shouldn't try to undermine it. And the Bible is very clear, actually. In fact, it's amazing how many scriptures and how clear these scriptures are that teach that Christians are marked by just living, by, by righteousness, and sinners are marked by the opposite. The issue here is not whether or not the Bible teaches this. The issue is whether or not we will simply submit to the numerous scriptures that are explicitly teach this. Sean says, backslide and apostasy is the same meaning. Amen. The New, t New, ten uh, the New Testament never mentions backsliding. Can a believer sin? Yes, but we continue in the faith. Amen. Uh, and I would say that this verse kind of mentions backsliding. backsliding. It says draw back. But backslide is basically the, the same thing. Um, but it says here that Christians don't do it. And if they did, they would go to hell. Because why? Not because they lost their salvation, but because they were not Christians. And we know this because he says, we are not of them that draw back to perdition. We are not of them who backslide. That's not how it works. Now, I'm glad you brought this up, Sean. Uh, backslide and apostasy essentially are the same thing, and that's true. Because when I say Christians cannot backslide, and I state that very emphatically, by the way, and of course, that that's a very controversial thing to say. And people say, well, of course Christians can backslide. Um, and they usually cite some sort of personal testimony or someone they know. Uh, but of course, I point out that's not where we get our doctrine. We don't, get our, we don't test the Word of God by our experience. We test our experience by the Word of God. Then they'll go to people like Lot, who committed a horrible sin, no doubt about it. He got drunk. Uh, he committed uh, incest with his daughters, albeit unwittingly. It was a horrible, wicked sin. Can Christians sin? Yes, Christians can commit horrible sins. They can fall into temptation. They can be led astray by their own lusts. Yes. The Bible does tell us this, that Christians can, theoretically, sin. And I know some people are wincing at that word, theoretically. But the Bible has such strong language that we're about to get into that makes it clear that this is, this is not something that should be the norm. We should... J.C. Alores, listening from the Philippines, so glad to see you, brother. Thanks for all the sharing you did the first week. That was a wildly popular episode, because uh, I think mainly because of you and some others who shared. Thank you for, for doing that. Anyway, what we're talking about here is, can a Christian backslide? The Bible is clear that we should not consider sinning as the norm in the Christian life. Christ, being a saint is the opposite of sinning. Being a sinner is the opposite of being a saint. You, we, we should not mix these two. And of course, some, some will say that, well, Paul was the chief of sinners. Yes, in his old life, of which he was speaking, read the context. Um, he was, he's not a sinner anymore. We're not sinners anymore if we're saved. Um, let's get into 1 John chapter 2. Oh, but to wrap that point up, Christians cannot backslide because backsliding essentially means to stop living for God, to go back to your sins like a dog returning to its vomit. And in that definition of backsliding, apostasy in other words, the Bible gives no room, none, none whatsoever, no room for a Christian to backslide. It says we are not of them that draw back or backslide. We are saved. That's a, that's the opposite of backsliding. We're saved, then there are people who backslide. In other words, there are false converts who try to be religious, who try to appease God, who try to bribe the judge, and they fall back. 
because they do not have the Holy Ghost living in them and empowering them. The Bible says, For as many as believe on him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You want power in your life? You want power to uh, overcome temptation? You want power to have victory over your flesh and the devil and the world? Get saved. God will give you power. If you're failing over and over again and you're living in the flesh and you are given over to sin and you occasionally turn over a new leaf and do right, guess what? Chances are you're lost. You don't need uh, more sanctification and, uh, and more walking with God. No, you need to find God. Sean says, Amen. Christians are saints and not sinners. People parrot what people say, but people do not obey the language of the Bible. Exactly. The Bible states that we should reckon ourselves dead to sin. When we focus on our unsaved past, getting good, Sean, we aren't obedient to God. Scripture teaches to forget our past. Our present identity is in Christ. Amen, amen, amen. That's exactly right. Let's look at uh, 1 John chapter 2. One way I put it is... Um, Yes, a Christian can sin. It should be the exception to the rule, though. It's like this. Uh, when a duckling hatches out of its egg, he goes to the water. He doesn't go to the pig's mud, mud wallow, right? The duckling goes to the water. He swims. It's instinct. That's what he does. Now, you might see a duck occasionally get dirty. They might, uh, uh, especially you know, on the shore of the water, they might get some mud on them. But usually they're in the water taking a bath, cleaning themselves, because that's their nature. A pig's nature is to enjoy the wallow. So while a pig may occasionally be clean, he's still a pig. And while a duck might occasionally leave the water and go to the mud, he's still a duck. And he's still going to stay on the water for the most part. That's his nature. Maybe not the best analogy, but work with me here. The Bible teaches that if you are born of God, you have a new nature. You have Christ dwelling in you and empowering you to do right. A backsliding is not something the Christian can do. Living in sin, in other words, is not something the Christian can do. Yes, you can stumble. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times, yet riseth again. So, yes, you can fall into temptation as a Christian. But no, if you're living in sin, be not deceived. You are a, a false convert. You are lost. As a dog returns to its vomit, Sean adds. Amen. All right, so 1 John chapter 2. And let's look at verse 19. They went out from us, speaking of people who apostatized or backslid, they went out from us. Why? But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt. Once again, emphatic, strong, inescapable language. They would no doubt have continued with us. There, there's your preservation of the saints, your perseverance of the saints. If they had been of us, if they have, had been of our Father, God, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. When people backslide and leave church and leave God and go back to their, their wallow, it's because they're of their father, the devil. Not because we need to work on them and God still doesn't have them quite up to the same level of sanctification as we do or something along those lines. No, the Bible says if they had stayed with us, it would have been because they were of us, but they didn't. They backslid. Why? Because they're not of us. And then just to drive it even further, he says, if they had been of us, they would have stayed. That's all there is to it. The Bible could not be clearer. The question, again, is not what the Bible says. The question is, what will you do with what the Bible says? Will you accept this or not? All right. Looks like we've got a few more coming on. Thanks, guys, for joining us. We're really going through a lot of scriptures tonight. Keep your Bibles handy. We're going to take up the whole hour, probably go all the way to 9.30 p.m. Eastern. Um, if you have any questions or comments, throw them in there, guys. I'll definitely try to, to pause and take a look and, and respond. If I can't do it during the broadcast, I will afterwards. Also, keep, an, uh, keep a, a, a thought on what we might study after this. If you have any ideas, maybe we could do another study uh, next month. I don't know. Um, and it doesn't have to be related to the gospel or repentance. We could do it on my Truth and Mercy Baptist Ministries timeline page. Um, it's not a like page. It's just my personal timeline, but I use it for ministry. We could always do a live broadcast there. All right, let's move on to the, well, let me check the comments real quick, make sure I'm not missing anything. Ryan has some good comments here. Ryan has a lot of good comments. Thanks, Ryan, about uh, what a Christian should do when he, he sins. And check it out. That's very good. This is skimming over. It looks very good. Anyway, let's continue. Look over at 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And uh, 
Oh yeah, this is a debated t um, reference that uh, really chaps the hides of the antinomians, the lawless ones. And again, the tie-in here, guys, this is a study about works and the gospel. We've seen over the past two weeks that works do not uh, contribute to salvation in any way. However, they must follow salvation or there is none. You cannot include works in the gospel, but you must include works after the gospel. The, the gospel requires works after salvation, or there was no faith that saved to begin with. Ooh, Ruben Garcia says a study on war. Yeah, that would be an interesting one. Good idea. And the Bible is a very confusing place for many people on that topic. Anyway, 1 John chapter 3, let's start in verse 5. And ye know that he was manifested, Christ of course, manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Okay, so why did Christ come? To save us from hell? No, as I mentioned in my book, Repentance from Sin. The reason, in fact, chapter 7 is called Saved from Sin. The reason we were saved was to be saved from sin. Why was Christ brought into the world and manifested? To take away our sins. If you're living in sin, you've missed the whole point of the gospel, and you've missed the gospel. So no, gospel, the gospel does not include works. But if your life doesn't include works after the gospel, then you missed out on the gospel. If you are not walking with God, if you are not uh, living in, uh, a righteous life, if you are living in sin then you are not born of God. Don't deceive yourself. Verse 6, Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So, he says, if you're sinning, then you've never even met God? Whoa! Look at verse 7, Little children, let no man deceive you. So there's apparently some deception on this topic that is rampant in Christian circles. Amen. He says, don't let anyone deceive you on this. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Oh, so you can judge a book by its cover. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Verse 9, who's, uh, uh, no, verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Again, why did Christ come into the world? Why did he die on the cross? To destroy sin to save you from sin, to purify a people unto himself, zealous of good works. Verse 9, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him and cannot sin, because he is born of God, the seed of God. In other words, you are now God's seed, God's child, born of God. You're regenerated. You're regened, in other words. You have a new nature. You're not that pig in the, in the uh, mud. You're that duckling who takes to water as... Uh, it's it's his nature, and that's his desire. And your desire should be towards righteousness. Because his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Notice, he doesn't say because he is sanctified and really mature in his Christian walk. No, it's because he's born of God. Born of God. If you're born of God, you have a, the nature of God. If you're not born of God, then you have the nature of the devil, and you'll do the works of your father, the devil. Verse uh, 10. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Now, this passage is hotly debated, because on one hand, he does make a statement that seems like it goes too far. He says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. And I don't believe we should interpret this passage um, in an exclusive, ultimate, um, absolute way that you'll never once commit sin. But what he's saying here is you won't commit sin as a rule. If you do commit sin, it will be on a, uh, um, it will be an exception, an exceptional event. It will not be uh, an a everyday thing, or at least not an, a continuous thing. Maybe some converts starting out might commit sins, you know, on a daily basis for a short time, but th that I would say that would be a very short and and uh, extenuating circumstance because he says whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin now when I reach a passage like this that even I find difficult because I do believe especially based on Bible but biblical examples like Lot who did sin like King David who sinned and many others who have sinned I do find that passage a little difficult but I must ask myself am I judging my experience by the Bible or am I judging the Bible by my experience? The Bible should be our final authority. And uh, some people have gone to the other extreme, and they've 
explained away this passage by saying that this is talking about the new man. I have a video on my YouTube uh, channel about the Christian's two natures. We do have a new man, and yet we do still have the old man living in us. And the Bible does teach us that we are, in a sense, uh, as Christians, schizophrenic. We, we have two natures vying for control of our soul. We have the flesh and we have the spirit. And so we do have a choice whether or not we will uh, follow our old nature or our new. Of course, when we get to heaven, we won't have the old nature anymore, and then we can only do new, uh, new uh, uh, righteousness. But as of right now, it is true, the Christian still has a desire to sin inside of him. And if he does not reckon it dead to sin, he will yield to temptation. And that's why the Bible says you have to walk in the Spirit. So I want to come back a little bit. We've gone to the extreme here to say, yes, the Christian could be said emphatically that he is a saint, that he is marked by righteousness. And yet I also want to take it back a step and point out that this does, does not mean that once you're born of, of God, you can never sin, that it won't happen. It's impossible for you to sin. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, but anyway, some people explain this by saying that you have um, a new man inside of you, which is true, and you have an old man, which is true. And they say, this is only speaking of the new man. They say, the new man does not sin and cannot sin. That is not what the passage is saying. We don't have time to read the whole chapter. But if you read the chapter, you'll see from the context that it never mentions anything about a new nature and an old nature. It never mentions anything about uh, anything to indicate that this is only referring to the Spirit of God that lives in you. It's referring to the Christian. And it says, because God dwells in you, you cannot sin. Not your new nature cannot sin, but your old nature can what it's saying is you, the Christian, do not sin. There is, as I said, occasional circumstances where Christians fall into temptation. The Bible says a righteous man falls seven times and rises again. You can fall into temptation. A Christian can do a sin just as wicked as anyone else. Look at Lot. Look at King David who was guilty of murder, adultery. Yes, Christians can sin and Christians do sin on occasion, but real Christians sin only occasionally. Only occasionally. I want to emphasize that. Um, Miguel says, what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Uh, the, an old uh, country preacher once once put it this way. He said, I've got two dogs. I feed this one. I don't feed that one. Who do you think is going to grow up to be the biggest and baddest and meanest dog? Well, the one I feed. It's a simple analogy, but it makes the point. If you're walking in the Spirit, that means you're reading the Bible. You're feeding the new man. You're praying. You're dwelling on the things of God. You're empowering that, that spiritual man to take control of your thought processes and your, and your soul. Whereas if you're, not, uh, if you're neglecting your Bible reading, if you're not walking uh, in prayer, then your flesh is going to get strong and your flesh is going to win the battle. So anyway, I hope that answered the question. All right, so 1 John chapter 3 does not, is not limited only to the new man. He says the Christian cannot sin or does not sin rather. Not that he cannot, but that he does not sin. As a rule, he does not sin because he's born of God and God's seed remaineth in him. Hope that made sense. A little complicated there, but I wanted to get in that, uh, that counter argument that some people make and address that really quickly. Read the chapter in your own time and check it out. You'll see no reference in the context that's, that limits this passage to the new man. It's not saying only the new man doesn't sin. It's saying the Christian does not sin. All right. It is top of the hour. We're about... Hmm, about halfway through, I think. So we're on track. Maybe uh, maybe a little behind. Let's try to speed it up a little bit. Hope I hope I don't lose you. I want to make these points clear, but I also want to try to get all these all these verses addressed because I've already cut out several verses when I was preparing these notes. Um, all right, so let's look over at um, 2 John and look over at verse 9. 2 John verse 9 says... Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Boy, what an absolute statement to make. What a, a very strong way to word that. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So, again, we see this emphatic language. He says, if you're transgressing, if you're living in sin, if you're uh, abiding in heresy instead of the true doctrine of Christ, then you don't have God. Flat out, you're not a Christian. But if you do have the doctrine of Christ, if you have right doctrine, which, by the way, isn't that, isn't that interesting? It equates false doctrine with sin. 
transgression. If you abide in the doctrine of Christ and walk with him, then guess what? You have both the Father and the Son. That's a, So you can judge a book by its cover, or the way Christ puts it, you can judge a tree by its fruit. All right, let's look at the next passage. Third John. Let's look over at Third John. And uh, let's look at verse 11. Third John, verse 11 says, another very emphatic statement here. Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Again, he doesn't say if you're doing evil, it's because you haven't been sanctified and you haven't matured enough in your daily walk with Christ. Nope. He says if you're walking in evil, you've never met God. So when I say this or when you say this to someone and they get offended, take them to, the, to this verse and say, I, I'm only repeating what God says. If you're not abiding in Christ, you're not saved. Now, be careful with this because everyone can fall into temptation. And don't let this be a source of pride to lift you up and say, oh, well, I'm sinless. And I, there's a lot of people who go too far with this sinless perfectionism. And they say, well, you know, I'm sinless and I've never sinned since my, my salvation or I haven't sinned in 20 years. I, 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 I do believe that sinless perfection is attainable and it is the desirable goal of every Christian. I have not reached it yet. I am working on it. And I'm not going to let the fact that I do believe it is rare in Christian circles discourage me from trying to attain it. I have not attained to sinless perfection, and I'm not going to beat you up if you haven't either, because there is something to be said for the daily process of sanctification. We are still growing in Christ. We all must learn to walk in the Spirit and feed the Spirit and resist temptation, flee the, flee, flee the lust of the flesh, and resist the devil. Um, so, yes, Christians do sin on occasion, they should fight this sin. They should walk in the Spirit, and then they would not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Um, and yet the Bible still has no problem with saying, and therefore with us saying, very emphatic statements like, if you're living in sin, you're lost. Again, don't take that to to puff yourself up and brag, well, I've not sinned. Well, chances are you, you do sin. Uh, chances are you're guilty of pride, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and yet... Again, we have to stick with the Word of God. It has to be supreme in our lives. It says emphatically, He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. There it is. Take it or leave it. Really, I mean, that's all there is to it. All right, so let's check out the comments. I saw you guys are having a great conversation. I probably won't be able to go through all that just yet. I'll check it out after the broadcast here. But uh, if you have any questions for me, get them in, guys. I'm loving this. <laughs> Okay, we've got a couple others joining us. Great, cool. All right, well, let's get on to the next. Um, oh, Sean mentions here. Well, just lost the page. Let me see if I can scroll over here. Yeah, Sean says, Hi, Miguel. Those who walk in the Spirit will show forth daily, moment by moment, holiness. Amen. This is brought about by consciously choosing by faith. Amen. Uh, faith is the victory, as the hymn says. That's how you achieve sanctification, not only after salvation, but, I mean, not only before salvation, but but during and after. Faith is the victory over temptation. Faith is the victory over the old man. Um, anyway, I'll get to the rest of that some other time uh, after the broadcast, I guess. All right, guys, let's get on to the next passage. Can a Christian backslide? No, we've seen this. They cannot live in apostasy. They cannot live in sin. Uh, will a Christian ever fall back, fall away, lose their salvation? No. If they were to fall away, they would not have had salvation to begin with. Can a Christian be sinlessly perfect? Yes. I believe it's, it's rather rare, unfortunately, because we don't have enough holiness preachers preaching against sin and preaching the law of God, and yet it is attainable, and it should be attainable. It should be desirable, because that's what God came into the world to begin with for. That's why Christ was, was manifested, the Bible says, to destroy the works of the devil. Not to have call a truce with the works of the devil and say, okay, well, you can sin some, but not a whole lot. Try to keep it down. Keep it to a bare minimum. No. Christ came to purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works, to destroy the works of the devil. Sin, in other words. So, if Christ has has come into your life and, born, and made you a new creature, then old things are passed away. Not will be at some future point of maturity, but are passed away. All right. So, let's move on. 
Let's look over at 1 John chapter 1. This is a common objection that people will, will bring to this discussion when, when they say, um, yes, Christians can be just as much sinners as lost people, and they can live in sin, and they can backslide. And uh, they will say 1 John 1, 8 proves this. So let's look at it. 1 John 1, 8 says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So they say, if you ever get to a point where you think that you're not sinning, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. But they've completely plucked this verse out of its context. Does this verse indeed teach that uh, that you can never be sinlessly perfect? Nonsense. Read the, the next two verses. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so right there he says, if you sin, you can confess it and God will cleanse you and make you stop sinning. The next verse clarifies verse 9, verse, uh, I mean verse 8. So verse 10 clarifies verse 8 and by, by saying, if we say that we have not sinned in the past, in other words, past tense, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So very similar wording to clarify verse 8, which says, if we say that we have no sin, those who object say, aha, if you say you have no sin in the present, well, then you're wrong. Of course, everyone is currently sinning, even Christians. Well, that defeats the entire purpose of the gospel, and I would say that is rank heresy. And it is doing despot, as the Bible says, to the spirit of grace. In, in uh, Hebrews, it talks about this. The spirit of grace is not lasciviousness. The spirit of grace, the Bible says, teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to walk righteously and soberly in this present world. That's what the, great, the spirit of grace is. And he says right here, if we say we have not sinned, in other words, in the past... Of course we've all sinned. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The point isn't whether or not uh, we've all sinned or are sinning now. The point is, have we been born of God and are we now empowered to overcome sin? The Bible refers to saints as overcomers. Why? Because they've been empowered. Uh, in fact, look over at 1 Peter 4 and we'll get a little clarification on this. 1 Peter chapter 4. Look at the first three verses. 1 Peter chapter 4. He says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, again, what's the point of the gospel? Arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, sinless perfection, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. No longer. In other words, stop sinning. Verse 3, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in past tense in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. He says, just like John did, if we say that we have not sinned, okay, obviously we have sinned, and, and Peter here is saying, there has been plenty enough sin in our past, we don't have to continue sinning. We've all sinned in the past, and then if we've been born of God, we no longer have to sin because we can have the mind of Christ. It is entirely possible, it is attainable for you to stop sinning and to live in holiness as you have been commanded. God told the Israelites, I don't make commandments in vain, by the way. So if God commands us to be perfect, which he does, he uses that word, be ye perfect. If he commands us to be holy, which he does, using that word, be ye holy, then that means be perfect, and you can be. That means you can be holy. It means stop sinning. You can stop sinning, and you should. And if you haven't yet, then keep trying. Keep yielding your, your members to the Lord. Keep walking in the Spirit. Keep seeking after His righteousness, and all these things shall, shall follow. Here he says it very plainly. Of course we have had sin in the past. If we say that we have not, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. We, in the time past, had plenty of sins. We don't have to have any more in our new life. We've had plenty enough sin in the past to have damned us to hell. As my book brings out, it is sin that damns the sinner. Not just the sin of unbelief, but all sin. There's plenty of sin in our past to have complied with the verse, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Good. We can now be perfect and not contradict that verse. We can, from the point of salvation, be perfect without contradicting all have sinned. And if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Of course, we have sin in our past. Everyone does. But we don't have to have sin in our present, and we should strive to not have sin in our present or future. 
For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lasciviousness, lusts, excess of wine, revelings. And then verse 4, wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot, speaking evil of you. Huh. So they may think it's strange when you teach that Christians no longer backslide, or Christians no longer live in sin, that they don't backslide, that they don't apostatize. They may think it's strange that you want to live holy, and that you might even be holy. And see, there's where the rubber meets the road. We can talk about holiness. I once told a guy, very interesting story, the pastor's son, in fact, of a church I, I once was a member of, he took great issue with um, me preaching against sin. No sin in particular, necessarily, although one finally did blow up. Uh, but he took real issue with me take, drawing a hard line against sin. And he tried to find things in my life that he could say were sin to say that I had sinned. And I actually told him, I said, at this moment, I'm not sinning. In fact, the Bible commands me to be holy and sinless. And so right now, to my knowledge, I don't have any sin in my life. And that should be what you strive for as well, brother. And he became so angry that he actually cussed me out. He told me if I set foot in his church again, he would beat me up. And uh, it came out a few weeks later that this man was committing adultery on his wife. And he left the church that, that his own father was the pastor of. His father actually harbored him in this secret sin and eventually had to resign the church. The church fell apart because of it. Um, but this goes to the heart of the issue right there. It's one thing to say we should be holy. It's another to say, I am holy before God. My sins are confessed up. I'm striving to live for God. Make application, in other words. Don't just theoretically say holiness is possible. Is it a reality, though, in your life? Are you holy? If not, why not? Get holy. Get perfect. The Bible says Job was a perfect man. I believe it says the same thing about Noah. So it is entirely possible and attainable, and it should be desirable, and it should be your goal, Christian. Be perfect. Be holy, even as your Father is holy. Make it a reality, not just a theological discussion we have on Tuesday nights. All right, let's look over, guys. At um, you all still with me? I, I know I've been kind of preaching. Um, let me see where we got here. Yeah, Sean says, 1 John 1, 8, I believe many are misusing that verse. Amen. Um, boy, there's a lot of good comments. I wish I could, could go through them. I'll, I'll go through them after the after the, uh, after the the uh, broadcast, guys. Good comments. Keep them coming. Yeah, Ryan's on a roll. <laughs> All right, let's look at the next passage, guys. We've got about, um, about 15 minutes left here. Let's see if we can wrap it up. Looks like I've lost internet again, of course. See if I can get that back. All right, and uh, if you have any ideas about what, what what our next study could be about, throw them in the comments below. I'd love to love to hear from you. And that, like I said, it doesn't have to be about the gospel or repentance, like we've been doing. It could be about anything biblically related. And uh, I'd love to continue these with you guys. All right, let's look over at um, Psalm one nineteen. Oh, talk about emphatic language. Psalm one nineteen. Starting in verse 1. Don't worry, we're not going to read all 150 verses of Psalm 119. Just the first few. Psalm 119. Blessed are the undefiled, the holy, the undefiled in the way, who walk in the law of the Lord. Ah, the law and the gospel. Don't ever try to mix them. Well, don't try to mix them in the sense that you would say the law contributes to the gospel, and yet, or to salvation. And yet, those who are saved by the gospel walk in the law. The blessed are those who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 2, blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart. That's walking in the spirit. Verse 3, they also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. Well, there you have it. Those who say that Christians cannot be sinless apparently believe God is lying at Psalm 119, verse 3. They also do no iniquity could not be clearer, folks. Christians are commanded to be sinless. They can be sinless. Many of them have been sinless. And I'm trying, and you should too. I don't know where you are on your on your personal walk with God, if you've attained to that point yet. And chances are, 
when you attain to it, watch out because you got some serious temptation coming and chances are you're going to fall into temptation. Don't be discouraged. Get right back up. Sinlessness is not a, a once and done. Sinlessness is a state of mind, really. It's a, a walking in the Spirit, yielding your, your, your members to the Lord. If you, if you weren't sinless yesterday, well, be sinless today. If you weren't sinless today, be sinless tomorrow. If you are sinless today, good for you. That doesn't mean you won't be tempted to sin tomorrow. Keep your guard up. Keep the armor of God on. Psalm 119.3 says, They also do no iniquity. And you can also do no iniquity, folks. All right. Look over at Galatians chapter 5. I told you tonight would be controversial. Ryan says, I hope I have all of this saved. That's why I'm sending it one after another. Oh, okay. So you've got, you're copying and pasting some of this. Yeah, if you've got an article or something, brother, feel free to share that. You can share it in our group. Uh, or you can post it to the like page if you'd like. All right, Galatians chapter 5. Look at Galatians chapter 5. This is a good one. Verse 24. Galatians 5, 24 says, And they that are Christ's, born of God, in other words, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Mm. And then verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we are born of God by the Spirit, then let us walk in God in the Spirit. Those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. That comes with the package, folks. If you're born of God, you're not going to be given to backsliding in a life of sin. If you are tempted in sin, so be it. Make better uh, a better attempt next time to yield your members to God, to walk in the Spirit. You were, after all, born in the Spirit. You have the power to resist the temptation, to flee it. All right, let's look over at, uh, we're almost done. We're wrapping up here, guys. Probably just another five or ten minutes. Um, look at John chapter 5. By the way, we're going to be getting, our last passage of the day is James chapter 2. You see that a man is justified by works. Very explosive language here. How are we going to summarize this study on, the, on works and the gospel? James chapter 2 really blows the lid off of this whole thing. All right, John chapter 5. And verse 29, John 5, 29 says, uh, well, let's, yeah, let's look at verse 28. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, verse 29, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So, does this teach work salvation? He just said, those who do good works will go to heaven. Those who do bad works will go to hell. I only see two, see two choices, folks. Either he's saying you have to do good works to go to heaven, or he's saying those who are going to heaven do good works. Those who have been saved by the gospel, not of, of works, but of faith, will then live according to the works of the law of God, of, uh, of the Bible, they will walk in the Spirit. They will please God. They will not sin and transgress God's law. He says, those who have worked for God, they will go to heaven. Not because they worked, but rather their work, they worked because they were bound for heaven, because they were eternally saved, because they were regenerated, regened, new nature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All right, we're actually making really good time. Last passage, before we get into it, I wanted to read a quote from Matthew Henry, the great commentator. I quote him extensively in my book, Repentance from Sin. He says in uh, chapter 7 of, of my book, I quote him here, it says, uh, We must not expect salvation without righteousness. You can't separate the two, right? For they spring up together, and together the Lord hath created them. What he has joined together, let not us therefore put asunder. Very poetic way of putting it. He says, see Psalm 85, 9 through 11. Christ died, he says, to save us from our sins, not in our sins, and is made redemption to us by being made to us righteousness and sanctification. This feeds into what we just read in John 5. He says, those who did right will go to heaven. Those who did wrong go to hell. Why? Is it because they did right or wrong? No, and yet the way God saves us is by giving us the righteousness of Christ. He's being made righteousness for us. God only lets righteous people into heaven. He, that's why he says in Psalm 24, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, 
who hath not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. He shall receive the blessing from the Lord, and he shall receive the righteousness from the God of his salvation. That's who gets into heaven, the righteous. The whole point of the gospel is not to say, okay, we'll make an exception in your case. You're not righteous, but you can get into heaven anyway. No, the point of the gospel is to make you righteous by swapping out your immorality for Christ's morality, for, for uh, swapping out your unrighteousness for Christ's righteousness. Christ is made redemption to us by being to us made to us righteousness and sanctification. Christ died to save us from our sins. That's the whole point of the gospel, as I get into in my book, uh, Repentance from Sin. All right, folks, last passage, James chapter 2. We're going to look at this in depth. If you have any final questions or comments, guys, get them in. I'll try to address them at the end of the broadcast here, and if I can't, I'll get to them afterwards. Um, James chapter 2, let's start in verse 17. Also, guys, if you have any ideas for our next study, I'd love to do another one of these, maybe just a little mini study. Um, put them in the comments what you think we should do next. All right. And uh, thanks again, guys, for everyone who has tuned in these last three weeks. This has been uh, a great little study. I'm glad you could join us. All right, James chapter 2, starting in verse 17. Even so faith, if it hath not works, it is dead, being alone. The study is on works and the gospel, and yet here he says works and faith must go together. We've spent the past two weeks proving, proving from Scripture that the just are saved by faith, not by the deeds of the law. It's not to him that worketh, but to him that believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So, why does James say a man is justified by works? He says, Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So, in other words, if you've got faith that saves, if you've truly been born again, you'll also have works. You will have works. The gospel does not include works. The gospel must be followed by works. That is the way the gospel works and the law intersect. The gospel comes to make us righteous. That's what we saw in Titus. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly. That's the point of the gospel. Verse 19. Thou believest that there is one God. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. A little tongue-in-cheek there. He says, you believe there's one God. Big whoop. The devils also believe that there's one God. They also believe. In fact, when they saw Jesus in the uh, maniac of Gadara, they said, you are the one Son of God. You are the sent of the Father. They knew that he was the Son of God. So they even had their... their uh, uh, they even were right on the doctrine of the divinity of Christ. They even had the right doctrine. A lot of devils have good doctrine. They are still false converts. They're still tares among wheat. And the Bible says the way we can tell this is by their works. You see a man is justified by works. Verse... 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works? Well, actually, Romans says he was justified by faith and not works. So, James, do you contradict Paul? Not at all. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Now, we do believe this is inspired scripture, right? Is he teaching works salvation? No, he's teaching works follow salvation. See, verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, there's faith, not works, but faith, pure, unadulterated faith, brings about salvation, salvation brings about works. You see then, seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by works was faith made perfect. Verse 23, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Ooh. If I were to have written those words in 21st century English in my book, I guarantee the antinomians would have screamed heresy. This man is adding works to the gospel. James is not adding works to the gospel, and neither am I. This is not adding works to the gospel. This is reestablishing the 
connection that has been lost in modern evangelicalism between the gospel and or salvation rather and works you cannot separate saving faith from living works if you are born of God you will live as your father John says expose the IFB easy believism churches exactly that's exactly what my, my book is all about uh, easy believism if you remove the law from your gospel presentation and stop preaching against sin so that sinners will understand their need for the Savior, well, then it's no surprise that you would also believe that people can be saints while being sinners, while living in sin, living like the devil. No, the Bible says that if they go out from us, it's because they were not of us, and this is how they're manifested. You can tell a tree by its fruits. All right, verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? When she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. If your faith did not produce a life of good works, your faith is dead. And James could not be any clearer on this, folks. The Bible is clear. This summarizes our study. You cannot add works to the gospel, folks. The only way to be saved is through the righteousness of Christ. We, even our own righteousnesses, are as filthy rags. And yet you cannot separate saving faith, the grace of God that bringeth salvation, from a life of sanctification. Can the sinner, uh, or can a saint be a sinner? No. Can a saint backslide and apostatize? No. Can a Christian sin? Yes. As an exception to the rule, Christians do sin. Christians are capable of the worst sins. And yet, that is against their nature. It is contrary to their nature. And if we see a repeated pattern of sin, we, on the authority of, of God's word, can proclaim, can declare to ourselves that that is a child of the devil. And we can proclaim it to them as well, because the Bible tells us, see, uh, search the scriptures, for in them you think ye have eternal life. These people think that they are, are going to heaven because they said a prayer, or because they walked an aisle, or maybe because they were baptized, or because they're in good standing at a church somewhere. But that's not what saving faith is. Saving faith changes a man. The Bible is clear. You can make these hard lines, these hard stands. Christians are marked by good works to the end. Christians will persevere in the faith. They are preserved by God. We are not of them that draw back to perdition, as the Bible says. No, we are of those. There's a, I don't know if I have internet right now. There's a let me see if I can look up another passage. I don't know the reference. In closing, there's a passage that says, We are persuaded of better things, things that accompany salvation. Does anyone know the reference I'm talking about? Let me see if I can find that. Persuaded of better things. I should have added that one. I, I didn't add that one in my study. It just came to me. Um, yeah, here we go. But, but Okay, let's look at Hebrews chapter 6. Last verse, I promise. Hebrews chapter 6. And verse 9. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Mm. So, good works must accompany salvation. If you're saved, you have good works. If you have a life of bad works, you're on your way to hell. You can be saved, you can be redeemed, you can be made a new creature. By repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ, you can be regenerated, given a new nature, and you can be freed from the bondage of sin. Folks, that's our study. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, let's get to a couple comments here. If I sin, I feel immediate conviction, divinity says. If I am struggling, I have such a godly sorrow overcome me, I cannot stay in a sin. It brings me to repentance. Amen. That is excellent. That is the difference between a lost person and a, and a saved person. Now, granted, a lost person can feel conviction, in fact, that's part of the gospel, is to bring about conviction by preaching the law. But, by the same token, a, a saint who sins is also brought to immediate conviction, not because they need to be re-saved, but because they have fallen out of fellowship with their father. And of course, no one wants to be out of fellowship with your father, whether earthly or spiritual. And so when you're out of fellowship, you'll feel that instant conviction. You will not enjoy that sin like others will, maybe for a season there will be some pleasure in it, but it is not in your nature, like that duckling in my analogy. You're going to take to water like a duck, right? That's how the saying goes, because that's in your nature. You're not going to take to sin like a sinner. If you take to mud, you're a, you're a pig. 
If you take to the water, you're a duck or a, fi a fish or something along those lines. We could go as far as we want with that analogy. The point here is if you feel sin feel conviction over your sin, that's a good sign. But it's not proof. Granted, a sinner can, can still feel conviction. But do you have that spirit saying, Abba, Father? That's the real witness that I talk about in chapter 9 of my book whether you can cry Abba Father whether you have that spirit that dwells that bears witness inside of you that you are born of God uh, let's see what else we have here uh, a lot of comments from Ryan I'll probably have to get to after the the, the broadcast alright guys I think that pretty much wraps it up thank you so much for joining us for this three week study um, I'll let you know if we come up with if we decide to do another study here in the next month maybe or the or the month following um, I would like to do another one if possible. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are. What would you like to study? If you have any other questions related to the works in the gospel, let me know. If you'd like to get a copy of the book, the link is in the first comment uh, on this Facebook video. Um, get the book, read it, get a copy for a friend, redeem uh, the, the gospel. Let's restore the gospel to its rightful message of repentance and faith. You cannot have saving faith unless you've repented of your sin. And uh, that's the message I'm trying to spread. Again, thank you so much for your time. God bless you. I love you guys. Let me know if you have any other ideas for our next topic, our next study. And until then, keep the faith and win the lost. Bye-bye.